join me in prayer. Almighty God, by your holy, wondrous ways, open our mind this morning and, and help our bodies to remember the movements that recreate the power through your word. Lord, may we see the world through the mind of Christ and live in the world as the foretaste of your new creation. May your word open for us all that you have for us to see. May it rest mightily on our hearts, on our lips, and may our hands and feet move with the words that you have given us. We ask this all in Christ's name. Our, our first reading this morning comes from Luke. And, and this is the third of four parables that Jesus puts together. Um, and he's talking to the Pharisees who are pretty indignant about him hanging out with sinners. He, he's not only hanging out with them, but he's eating with them. He's breaking all of the dietary laws of the Jews. And, and, and they're annoyed with it. They're, they're, they're annoyed with him. And so he launches in with the parable of, of God's concern for even one wayward person. I, I'm sure many of you remember the parable of the single lost sheep. And he starts with that, and he talks to the Pharisees about that, and then continues uh, with another parable about a lady who loses one coin and, and sweeps her entire house just to find that one little coin. And, and it's all about God's concern, though, isn't it? When, when we hear a parable, we know that, and, and I'm not trying to strip them down for you, but we know a parable is something for us to read in. And when Jesus gives a parable, he's trying to make a point. And, and, and he moves from there into the parable of the wayward son. The thing about that over the centuries we've moved it, we've always called it the, the, the parable of the prodigal son, but it's really not, is it? It really is the parable of God. It's really the parable of a father's love for his son, of God's love for his people, all of God's grace, mercy, love, compassion, generosity is shown loud and clear in this parable. And Jesus shares it for the Pharisees to see, and of course, for us to look and marvel at. Jesus asks, how much more important is, is one lost sinner than 99 righteous people? Or how much joy can there possibly be in heaven when even one sinner repents? The depths of the Father's forgiveness and mercy is given to everyone who turns back to God. And notice, like the shepherd who goes searching for that one sheep, or the lady who sweeps her entire house for that one lost coin. The father doesn't wait for the son to come home. He races down the road to embrace his son. Jesus says to the Pharisees in these parables that we are, not, we are given a mission by God. Can't you see it? He says to them, I, I didn't come for the healthy or to heal those that are whole. I came for the broken and the sick. The healthy do not need a doctor, do they? So let us listen now as Jesus continues to share with the Pharisees the parable of love and grace. Ooh, there you go. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. 
he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servant, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Thank you. So the party began. What an incredible statement. The party began for the lost child who had squandered away all the gifts of the father. The party began for the child who thought that they knew what they needed. They needed to be far away from the parent. The party began for the child who realized that they really needed what was always right in front of them the whole time. They needed to be at home with their father. And yet, the question remains, why would a parent take back a child who so desperately needed to get away from them? Why would a parent take back a child who had completely abandoned them? Who is this child that it could be so important? Who is this child that it could be so forgiven? Who is this child that it could be so loved? This parable is just read so uniquely, and it's only found in Luke. It's such a unique parable, and it speaks so loudly. It reminds us of how special and precious we are to our Heavenly Father. Even when we wander, and even when we wonder who we are, our Father in Heaven is always with us. Who are we that we are so blessed? Our second reading this morning comes from the last portion of this third parable of Luke's. And, and so the, the parable really has two parts to it. It's the first part where we find that the wayward son has returned to his father seeking forgiveness. And then suddenly the son that has returned is is, is left to himself. He's gone from the story. Do you notice that? He doesn't interact anymore. And the older son has come to find out that his brother is getting a party for getting back. And and so that he, he won't come inside. So the father goes out to him and, and he just can't figure out why the father is so loving to this kid that ran off for a life of wine, women, and song. And, and so that's where the second part of this, this parable comes in. And, and I'd like you to listen closely to it. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. 
His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet, when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. I've been, I've been titled uh, today's sermon, uh, You Were Made for So Much More, because you'll find that in this parable. If you, if you, um, if you, look, you look at your bulletin, and on the front page, a lot of times we just scan by it, but the pictures on the front actually make sense. Can you see what it is? They're eggs. And there's birds. The birds are a little harder to see than the eggs. See, now everybody's looking again. There's birds? Yeah, there's birds there. There's shots of eggs. And then there's shots of birds. And the birds are a little bit more hidden. Eggs are meant to become birds, right? They, they break out of their protective shell and they fly free and experience everything that God has for them. And so the question I have to ask us this morning, are we really any different? Are, are, we, are we being an egg or are we being a bird? Have, have you broke out of your shell? Do you prefer the protective shell? Because everything you need for life is in there. Or are you broken out of that protective shell and you're becoming everything that God has in store for you? Because you were made for so much more. So of course I'm talking about breaking out of what is safe and secure, what is, what is normal that you don't want to go outside of your box with. Because that's what an egg is. An egg is the perfect, perfect life-giving design. Everything is in there for that egg to grow. And as long as it stays an egg, it's perfectly protected. But once the baby bird starts to break out of that egg, it has to do what? Learn how to fly. And, and, but a bird always comes from an egg, and an egg is always meant to be a bird, <laughs> unless it's meant to be an omelet. <laughs> it's always meant to be a bird. It's always meant to be bigger and more than what it actually is. The egg's all nice and secure in there. And, and I mean, if you look at that, they're, they're so beautiful. They're, it's a, they're the perfect design. Everything's in there. They have life. They're growing. They're in the sun. They'll get warmth. It's a perfect design, isn't it? But the question I have to ask you is, what happens to the egg if it just stays an egg? If nothing ever breaks forth from it, if nothing ever comes free, if the bird never leaves the egg and learns how to fly, learns how to soar, because the egg is made for so much more than just being an egg. It's meant to be a bird. And it's meant to give birth to other birds and to bring more life. In, in our parable this morning, one of the things that we find really is, is instead of finding that in what the father's love is giving to his son, we find a son that says, no, no, I was made for so much more. Yeah. God says you were made for so much more, but if you change it around, it's only a couple words, isn't it? He says to his father, he says, well, I was here. I've been here. I've slaved. I've been your worker forever. And what do I get? Now, it's pretty easy to sympathize with him, isn't it? And, and for those of us that have been in the church for a long time, 
And then we see new churches starting up, new congregations starting up and, and doing incredibly well. It's easy to kind of get a little bent. You know, a little, a little bothered. Why is it that God seems to be blessing them more than us? But is he? Is he? Or, or, or are we falling into the same thing as the older son? In the closing moments of this parable, we find an overwhelming example of the father's grace and compassion towards his children. The child's outside of the party, refuses to come in. It'd be so easy for the father to just go, yeah, no, never mind, he'll, he'll get over it. But let, let's look at the words a little bit before we, before we go on. All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. Is it just me or does he seem to be a little self-righteous here? Has anybody ever done absolutely everything their parents have told them to do? (laughs) Okay, maybe I was a bit of a bad kid, but I'm gonna say no. And in all that time, you never even gave me a young goat for a feast with my friends. Actually, that sounds pretty fair didn't get a young goat, I'd be a little annoyed. But here's the question that this statement begs. Did he actually ask his father for a young goat so that he could have a party? We don't know, do we? And, and here's something that, that, that we need to notice from the previous reading, the beginning of this, is, is that the wayward son is not partying with his friends, is he? He's having a celebration with the Ah, you see, it's easy to miss. The servants. They're not friends. They're servants of the Father. And then the son says, and yet when this son of yours, have we ever done that with his children? That daughter of yours. <laughs> yeah, because we're annoyed. We, we don't want to admit any, that there's any part of us there. Comes back after squandering his money on prostitutes. I'm not sure that's in the text, but okay, maybe he, maybe he got some word on his brother. But then the question is, why didn't he share it with his father? And you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. That to me sounds like the father was already getting ready for some celebration anyways. Something was going to happen. He was getting ready for something. Why was he fattening a calf? He didn't know the other son was going to have come. And yet we find in this that the father is so incredibly patient with this son who is so angry and so demanding, saying, why is it I don't feel like I'm getting everything? And he says, son, you have always been with me. And everything I have is already yours. You don't, you don't have to go anywhere. It's already yours. All you have to do is accept it. This is the fourth parable, which isn't in our reading this week, is, is, is probably known to quite a few people about the rich man and Lazarus, and, 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 and he calls the father Jacob, and, and he tries to get his brother saved. And, and, and Jacob says to him, Lazarus can't go and tell him. You had the opportunity here on earth to hear these things, to do these things, to accept the things that God had already given you, except the things that the Father had already put before you, but you decided not to, and your brothers decided not to. And, and, and so when, he's, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, he's saying, look, you are the teachers, you are the people that have already been in the, been in the assembly of God, and you're worried about me eating and associating with sinners. It starts to sound a little silly now, doesn't it? Because if you don't associate with sinners, there's not going to be any new rocks. There's not going to be any new people. There's not going to be any grace of God being shared with anyone. And he's spending his time trying to get them to understand that like the egg, they're still the egg. They haven't blossomed into the bird yet. 
They haven't let go, broke forth from the shell, and seen everything that God has for them. Everything God has is already theirs. If you look at the person beside you, go ahead, you can do that. Look at the person beside you or behind you, and say to them, everything God has is yours. How does that feel? Everything God has is already yours. Everything God has is already yours. Does that change the way you look at your day? Or you're kind of annoyed still about that church down the street that has three times the amount of people this morning? Yeah, you see, it changes. You go, hallelujah for them. Thank you, Lord. What is it that we can do? to embrace what it is you have given us, to embrace what it is you would have live us out. So the question becomes this morning, because it's easy to be the angry older brother or older sibling, have you accepted God's gifts of love to you? Have you accepted that everything God has is yours? And if that's everything is yours, what are you going to do with it? What are we taught? I didn't put this on there, but I should. Yeah, I should have. It should have said, give it away. Because no matter how much we give away, how much do we have? Everything. There is no possible way for us to give everything of God's away. We continue to give and give and give and give. And God continues to do what? Give and give and give and give. There's no possible way. And and that's why the son's anger is so amusing. But the way the father handles it is in grace and compassion. And he says, everything I have is already yours. And that's when the party began. And for us, that's when the party should begin for all of us. So let's start the party by embracing everything that God is giving us. Let us pray. Lord, you are a merciful God. And this morning, if we find ourselves like the prodigal son, and, and, and we have strayed from you this day, Lord, call us back to your loving embrace. And, and if like the, the elder son, Lord, and, and, and we harbor resentment, or we hold back grace from others, Lord, help us to open our eyes to see not only the love that you have for those around us, but the love that you have for us. Lord, help us claim in thought and deed the inheritance of all the saints who share with Jesus compassion and forgiveness to everyone who's around them. Lord, in all I do today, use me to be a sign of your reconciling love. Let not me view anyone from my vantage point, Lord, but let me see them through your eyes. Let me see those I encounter through the eyes of Christ, through whom I pray, amen.